Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Use the Power of AI to Deliver an Extraordinary Customer Experience, presented by Redpoint and MarTech. I'm your host, Cynthia Ramsaran. Before we begin, if you have any audio issues, click the screen to enable your audio. If you have any viewing issues, you can use the Q&A section at any time to communicate with us. You can send questions directly to the speakers about their presentation at any time. Now let's get to the presentation. Joining us today is Annette Franz, CEO of CX Journey, and Steve Zisk, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Redpoint Global. Welcome to you both. I'll turn things over to you, Annette. Thanks so much. And thanks everybody for joining us. This is going to be a great topic for us to talk about today. And Steve, I'm excited that I'm doing this with you. So thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. Thanks, Annette. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> All right, everyone, let us dive in and get started. We are going to talk about AI and how to use that to deliver a, an, an amazing and extraordinary customer experience. And with that, I always like to start my presentations with definitions, right? What is customer experience? Because I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page about what customer experience really is. So I, I, I like to define it as the sum of all the interactions that a customer has with a brand over the life of the relationship with that brand. And probably even more importantly, and this is really important to our conversation today, the feelings, the emotions, and the perceptions that customers have about those interactions. But I can't talk about what it is without talking about what it isn't, right? So customer experience is not customer success, customer service, customer care, customer satisfaction, customer marketing. And I like to, you know, the one that is often used most interchangeably with customer experience is customer service. So I always like to pull this one out of that list and just make a real clear delineation between what the two of them are. Um, and, I, and I like to use Chris Zane, who is the founder of Zane Cycles in Connecticut. I like to use his definition or the way he distinguishes between the two to really help people understand the difference between the two. So he says, service is what happens when the experience breaks down. Service is what happens when the experience breaks down. So if we design the experience to be great, if we design it to be, I don't want to say flawless, but if we design it to meet expectations and maybe even exceed a little bit, um, then customers don't need to contact customer service to fix issues and, and, and answer any questions they may have. Um, customer experience also is not technology. And, and we'll I'll talk about this a little bit today as well as I go through my slides. You know, AI is, a, is obviously a, a form of uh, technology, but customer experience is not technology. Technology and, and by, by um, association, AI is not the experience, right? It supports and facilitates the delivery of the experience, but it is not the experience itself. Again, the experience is very much about the feelings, emotions, and perceptions. And finally, um, the customer experience is not just about what happens at the front line. And I think this is really important. I think everybody thinks that that experience is something that happens face to face. Just know that your back office is just as impactful on the customer experience as the front line is. Think about the things that happen be behind the scenes that are there to, you know, deliver a great experience. I always use the example of, you know, invoices and statements and those kinds of things. The folks who are creating those very rarely do they actually talk to your customers because if customers have questions about those, they'll call customer service. Those folks, if they don't, if the invoice isn't accurate, if it isn't, you know, thorough, if it is, if it's confusing, that makes for a bad experience. So we always have to make sure that the back office knows what a great customer experience looks like as well and how they impact it. All right. So what are customers' expectations today, right? What are they thinking about the experience today? And, and the only way that you're really going to know what they are is to ask them and talk to them. But what we've seen, especially over the last year and a half, and some of these things that I'll talk about here don't just come out of the pandemic. They were already expectations as we went into the pandemic. But some of them have, you know, been have been amplified that much more. So they their expectations are that the experience is fast, convenient, easy, effortless, frictionless, simple, personalized, contactless. They expect instant gratification and so much more, right? This is really the new normal for customer experience going forward. And the other thing that's important to note here too is that this isn't just about B2C, this is B2B as well, right? And I think the important thing with B2B is that you have to remember that people buy from people and that the expectation set for B2B 
for your B2B customers really come oftentimes from their own experiences as customers, as consumers. So it's really important that we keep up with these customer expectations in order for the business to survive. But what does that mean for you, right? What, what, what does that mean for brands? So first of all, customer expectations are high, but patience is not. <laughs> Probably even worse now than it was, you know, two years ago. Um, so it's time to use better tools, right? Specifically AI to facilitate the experience to meet those expectations for both employees and for customers. And as we go through the slides today, I am talking about both employees and customers, right? The employee experience drives the customer experience. So it's really important that we focus on the experience for both. So if we infuse AI into our digital platforms, that speeds up decision making and it really facilitates presenting the customers with relevant offers, relevant products, relevant content, relevant services. AI is, is such a powerful tool to help with that. It also enables that proactive and, and frictionless customer journey that helps the customer feel like you know them and that you recognize who they are. So really important tools, right? Um, AI helps your, uh, your agents you know, they've got per these sort of personal assistants for human agents, right? We'll talk about all these things as I go through the slides over the next 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, but just remember that the interaction or I'm sorry, the experience is always human, very much human. Again, going back to the feelings, emotions and perceptions, right? But the more technologically advanced that brands become, the more, and this is really interesting, the more that people want to interact with humans rather than just the technology, right? So, so really important to keep in mind. And this next slide here, I think sort of speaks to that as well. So Gartner made some predictions, Microsoft made some predictions. Um, Gartner said that by 2020, 85% of customer relationships would be managed without human intervention. Well, here we are in 2021 and I don't think we met that. What do you think, Steve? <laughs> I don't think we met that at all. So, so that one sort of fell by the wayside. But the Microsoft one is really interesting because this they say that by 2025, 95% of all customer interactions will be through, ch through channels supported by AI technology. So I think that's more likely to happen because now we're using AI to support. And we'll talk about some of those things as we go through some of the slides. You good with that one, Steve? Do we think we can uh, we can hit that one in, in four years? I think we absolutely will. The interesting thing to me is, will the customers themselves be able to see that or be able to tell? Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. And that, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on uh, down in the slides as well. So on the flip side, sort of to what I just spoke about earlier, P PwC found in their research that 75% of customers uh, globe, uh, you know, worldwide, 82% in the US, want to interact with a real person more as the technology evolves and improves. So that's gonna be a real important thing here is to make sure that we can, uh, with the technology, the AI, everything can work hand in hand with, uh, with your humans. <laughs> All right, so that's all good. Let's talk. A, let's throw out another definition. I'll have a few definitions as as I go through these slides here. So, what is AI? Right, it's it, it, technology, a system that performs tasks normally requiring human intelligence or human or or, or human interaction um, or something that mimics uh, human intelligence. Right, Investopedia said the simulation of human intelligence and machines that are programmed to think like humans and to act like uh, humans as well. And there are a lot of different, there are a lot of different kinds of AI, a lot of different AI tools out there. And I just threw some examples up here. There are a lot more than this, right? I could have probably done 10 slides just with different AI um, tools and technology. So voice assistant, speech recognition and natural language processing tools, sentiment analysis, robots and RPA, and actually it's intelligent automation, right? So it, bringing AI into the robotics and RPA is intelligent automation. Self-driving cars, although I use that loosely today because <laughs> we know that Tesla's in a little bit of a, a little bit of hot water with their autopilot uh, technology right now. So um, chatbots, behavioral analytics, predictive prescriptive analytics, and uh, conversational AI. Anything you wanna add to, to that list there, Steve? No, I think that that's a really good list. The only thing that I would add is that uh, some of this is stuff that's going to be directly customer facing. Other pieces like um, uh, automatic selection of content, automatic selection of messages um, are, are things that happen behind the scenes that ideally customers don't even know there's AI going on there. Yeah. 
and and some of that we'll talk about a little bit later about sort of that creepiness factor and how do we do that without really making it feel creepy. So, yep, good point. Good point. All right. So where's AI being used today, right? Um, what we're seeing, this is a study from 2020. What we're seeing is that it really is used most prominently in customer service, in the contact center. Three years from now, even more so. That's the dark blue line here is three years from now. The interesting one that I saw here was around sales and marketing that anticipating in three years that AI usage will double. So is that is that what you guys are seeing, Steve, at, uh, at Redpoint? Yes, it is. Uh, partly just because uh, there's a lot of good use cases for AI in terms of exactly what you were talking about, how to improve the customer interaction, but also because AI ends up um, to, to another point that you made um, part of the employee experience. How do we how do we leverage employees to make them more productive? And right. that's happening in a big way in sales and marketing. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. I would agree. I'm seeing that too. All right. So I'm going to, over the course of the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, I'm going to chunk out AI in a couple of different ways. So the first one, first thing that I want to look at is AI versus ML. So artificial intelligence versus machine learning. What's the difference? What, what are we seeing there? So let's start again with some definitions, right? AI, obviously we, I just defined that and it's really about sort of machine intelligence, right? and mimicking human actions. Whereas machine learning is, it's a field of AI, it's a field of artificial intelligence, and it uses um, statistical methods to um, learn from data, learn from observation, learn from mistakes, so that there's very little human inter interaction, if any, involved sort of in the program, because it's doing exactly what it says, it's learning. So, so a very powerful tool. So AI really means that, you know, there's a human engineer that's, um, you know, not coding for each and every possible action or interaction is machine learning is testing, it's retesting, you feed it, you know, a data set and train it. Uh, and, and then it's able to predict, you know, every possible outcome, right. And the cool thing about it is, is that it can do it faster and more accurate than any human can possibly do, right. Any questions about the accuracy there, Steve, have you seen any concerns about that? Or is that what you guys are seeing too, is that it, it is really faster and more accurate than humans? Uh, we're seeing it that it is much faster and more accurate, but that it's also um, subject to more issues with data bias and um, yes. uh, data trust problems. Yeah, absolutely. That is key to successful AI implementation. Absolutely. All right. So the big question is, do people really understand the difference between AI and machine learning? And does it matter? Right. I would say, you know, obviously they work hand in hand you know, ML is a form of AI. The words are often used interchangeably. Does it matter? Probably in general to the general population. No, I don't think so, because it's still such a black box out there for most folks anyways. Um, so probably doesn't really matter. But for business, business purpose, I, I think it does, because we use AI to, you know, carry out these complex tasks. And machine learning, while it's a form of AI is really used to, um, to, you know, it, it, it teaches and it, and it, I'm sorry, it learns and it, and it responds to what it learns and, and evolves. Right. And so it's a really powerful tool in that sense. Human AI has, I think more human input than machine learning. Machine learning has that, that human input it's, but it's the data and it just keeps learning and learning on itself and evolving from there. Would you add anything to that, Steve? And do you agree that most people don't really care or know the difference between the two? I think certainly the people who are interacting with an AI or ML program don't care at all. The people yeah. who might care are the people who are trying to decide how to use it and what to do with it. Because yeah. exactly as you said, um, there's a scoping difference. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way to put it, summarize it <laughs> in short and sweet terms. There's a scoping difference. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So next, next sort of bucket of, of, 
thoughts that we had as we were talking about AI and the customer experiences around AI and empathy, right? You know, the experience is about feelings, emotions, and perceptions. Empathy is all about that, right? So let's start with a definition of empathy, which is really the capacity to be able to understand or be aware, be sensitive to the emotions and, and the feelings and the perceptions and the experiences of the people who are in front of you, right? To, to really have the ability to not only understand, but share in the feelings that they are experiencing. Is that something that, you know, AI can can do for us as well? Well, let's let's talk about that in just a second. I love this quote from Tim Brown of IDEO. Empathy is at the heart of design. Without the understanding of what others see, feel, and experience, design is a pointless task. And we know that as customer experience professionals, we know that empathy has to be at the at the root of designing an experience. Otherwise, the experience isn't going to be a good one. If you are interacting with your customers and you don't take the time to listen and to care and to really respond in a manner that you know fits that situation, it really falls flat and it really frustrates your customers. So I think this is a really important thing to do. So how do we how do we make that connection between AI and empathy, right? How can we still implement an AI strategy that really brings, you know, takes empathy to heart? And I think that just like with a digital transformation, with digital experience, the customer is at the center of that, right? It's not about the technology. It's not about your, you know, your digital strategy and all those kinds of things. The digital strategy has to have the customer at the heart of all of that. And AI is par probably part of your digital transformation for the most part too. So I think it's just important to remember that never forget the customer. The customer always has to be front of mind as you're designing your strategy. How is it gonna impact the customer? How's it gonna impact the employee? And really keep those in mind as you are um, designing the experience. Here are a couple examples of how to use AI, it, it, you know, to help to achieve that empathy as well, right? I, li I like the examples that I'll give are in the contact center because this is obviously such an important, you know, pervasive use of AI at the moment. Um, when we use AI to increase agent efficiency, what that really does is a couple of different things, right? First of all, we've got AI in the background assisting agents to find answers. If you if you work in a contact center, if you've ever been around a contact center, you know agents have 13 or 15 screens open at the same time and they're just trying to find information and it's so frustrating. And I think we all know that phrase, Steve, it's, oh, my computer's really slow. Oh, my computer is just, it's, I don't know what's going on with it today. That's what's happening, right? They are flipping through 13 screens trying to find your information. Imagine if you've got AI running in the background and this is happening today. I know that this is happening in contact centers today. AI is finding, it's listening to the conversation and it's finding the information that you need to help that customer that's on the phone with you, right? So that frees up time for the agent to really focus on the customer, to listen to the customer, to really understand, to, to pick up the tone and the frustration and then respond accordingly, right? So again, freeing up the agent to do that and freeing up the agents to spend more time on complex and higher higher need issues, higher value uh, conversations that help to ultimately strengthen the relationship with those customers. Another way that we use AI um, to help with, you know, the, you know, make, make that interaction um, with empathy, right, is to use the AI to provide feedback to the agent. So again, listening in on conversations and hearing and, uh, and understanding the customer's emotion, the tone and what, what's happening in that conversation to say, hey, you know, the, the AI, the bot is saying to, or the, you know, the AI is saying to the uh, agent, you know, this customer sounds frustrated, perhaps offer this or offer that or say this or say that. And I've seen, I've seen examples of that and it makes such a huge difference because as, as humans, <laughs> we are obviously very emotional people and we will interact and react to what's happening in front of us. So if we've got somebody frustrated, our initial reaction or response is to respond in a tone that would, you know, it's sort of, we keep the conversation at the same level. But having this AI making those types of suggestions, look, look, doing you know behavioral analytics behind the scene, using that to coach uh, the agent on what to say either in the moment or later is really powerful way to bring empathy into um, into that call, into that conversation, um, all with the help of AI. And then finally, you know, 
if we use AI to meet our customers' needs and their expectations, this is all about listening and understanding and, and really knowing what they want and what they need, which is obviously, you know, what I talked about earlier, sort of that new normal of CX, right? So today's advanced AI technologies, you know what, they can, <laughs> they're so advanced that they can have sort of these bi-directional human-like conversations. And that's the conversational AI that we, we talked about earlier. It's pretty powerful. And it's such a time saver. You know, we look at first contact resolution, we look at faster response times, we look at some of these contextualized interactions, anticipating needs, reducing effort, all of those things, all of that can be done with with AI, either whether it's running in the background or it's the it's the tool that is interacting directly with the customer. Um, Steve, anything that you are seeing or anything you want to add to that? No, I think this is a, uh, again, you've, you've hit the nail on the head here. Um, uh, AI can be thought of as an assistive technology to make everything have less friction. Um, the only other thing that I might add is that the, the, the AI can actually um, um, uh, predict future needs as well. So things like um, training customer agents or helping to schedule when are we going to need extra agents on site or um, uh, sort of helping to respond to situational um, systems. If the weather is bad, then I'm going to need to have um, tow trucks deployed in this kind of location. Those kinds of anticipatory needs are also a way of reducing friction. That's a, that's a great point. And again, that also brings sort of that empathy into the conversation, right? Because now, now you are aware of all of those situations that AI is bringing that information into you, handling some of the things, removing some of the stress off of the agent so that the agent can spend time. And to your point about sort of workforce management too, making sure you've got enough folks in the contact center who are there to help and, and be available to address whatever the situation is. So, so very powerful, absolutely. All right, so let's take a look at AI and humans. Not that we haven't already been doing that, but I'm referring to specific humans here, and these are your employees, right? How does AI help them or impact them, right? Again, the important thing here is that the employee experience drives the customer experience. So this is a really important thing for us to consider here. So in this regard, I want to look at automation. I talked a little bit about automation earlier, especially intelligent automation, which is the type of automation that brings AI and machine learning into it. But and technically, automation is really this wide range of technologies that reduces human intervention and, and you know, minimizes human input. Really what it's doing is it's, it's um, taking over repetitive and menial tasks, it's streamlining processes, and really freeing up time for your agents, for your employees, whoever it is. You know, I talked about how many screens a, um, a contact center employee has open. I had done some work for a client who, it was their accounts payable team. Accounts payable folks have, or was it, I think it was receivables. They have 500 tasks that they need to do every day. 500 tasks. And if we can automate that, if we can bring in some tools to help remove some of that menial stuff. And a lot of it is creating web uh, spreadsheets, right? Building spreadsheets and, and just updating the data in those spreadsheets. If we can have those processes automated to free up some of their time to focus on sort of the more value added work, what a, what a lifesaver, right? What a time saver. So I think this is really important. So there are different types of automation. Uh, you know, I've listed out a couple of them here, but really what automation is about right now is automating processes and not people. So, you know, the biggest question that I'm always hearing about automation is, will I lose my job as a result of this, right? Or of this or any other AI tools. And, and, and again, no, the automation really is about the processes, not the people right now. I don't know what'll happen, you know, 50 years from now, but right now it's really about, about the processes. Um, it really frees up the employee's time to do that value add work. And I think what's going to end up happening in the future as we continue to introduce more of this automation and the intelligent automation, the AI and some of these other tools into the workplace is that there's really going to be a requirement to upskill and retrain employees to do a couple of different things. First of all, to work in collaboration with these tools. And then second, maybe it's a it's a it's a up leveled job as well, right? It's a different role that's related to what they're doing, but 
maybe it's got more responsibility, greater responsibility. Um, so I think that's a that's a really important thing to note, right? And I think that's a good segue into the, the, the next section, which is something that we have to keep in mind as AI and automation becomes more and more prevalent behind the scenes to help uh, employees and, and, and reduce these um, processes or minimize these processes. How is it going to, how, how are, how's it going to impact customers? How's it going to impact consumers? What does that look like in terms of trust? Can we trust AI? Can we, how do we instill trust when we're using AI, right? So I think that's an important, uh, important conversation for us to have as well. So I think we have to start with some basics first. <laughs> Pega Systems did some research just within the last year or two, and they found that basically customers don't even really trust brands to begin with, right? The majority feel that brands don't have a customer's best interests at heart in general, not even related to AI, just in general, right? And uh, right alongside that, that, you know, 69% feel that, you know, there's a moral obligation for businesses really to do what's right by the customer and for the customer. They looked at um, an example of using AI to help to make decisions um, in uh, the mortgage industry. And customers or respondents to this uh, research said that they trust the human more than the AI to make those types of decisions, right? And very few are comfortable with companies using AI to interact with them. So there's an uphill battle there. And especially when it comes to trust, I think there will be a, an uphill battle to uh, building trust for um, with customers when it comes to AI. There's a couple of things that that brands can do though to help themselves and and to help customers feel a bit more comfortable. And I think the number one thing really is to educate customers on your usage of AI. Be transparent about it. Don't be, you know, if you're going to be creepy, don't be creepy. That's just not a good idea at all, right? We need to educate customers and let them know what we're doing and we need to give them the ability to opt out. I think that's an, an important thing. Give them the ability to opt out and use some other channel or use some other method to either communicate or interact with the brand. I think those are really important. The other thing that's important is that brands should only really reference data that customers have shared with them. If you start talking about things that you know about customers with them on the phone behind the scenes that isn't in your account or isn't something you've already shared in terms of feedback or something like that that's when you start to get really creepy unless you're you're you know open kimono and you shared with them that this is how we're using your data which maybe some companies do but it's i think steve it's in sort of this terms and conditions in a two-point font somewhere on their website <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big contributor to why people are are opting out and uh, yeah. demanding GDPR and all of that is they can't exactly. understand. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then finally, a couple of other things, right? Make sure that your training data when it comes to your machine learning and your and your in your AI, but especially in the machine learning, um, is clean and unbiased. And then finally, have a backup plan. If a bot fails or if your AI fails somewhere, you've got to have a backup plan to make sure that customers aren't left high and dry as they're in the middle of an interaction or a conversation or whatever it is, right? So make sure you've got a backup plan. You know, we talk a lot about this sort of creepy stuff, but AI has obviously has a lot of benefits. We've talked about some of the, you know, time saving and the, you know, reducing the friction and, um, you know, making, helping to make employees more efficient and effective. But there are, there are a lot of benefits to AI, obviously. And it's, obviously it's, you've got to use it right, do it right, talk about it, be open and transparent about it, but it can really offset human error, emotion bias, right? It's faster and more accurate than humans can be at, at this point. Uh, but I think it also is important that it is used to assist in decision-making. That's not a sole decision-maker, but it assists in decision-maker. And that's how we save a lot of time and, and money and effort when we use it to in, in that manner. And then it can be faster and more accurate than, than humans can be. So I think those are some great benefits. Any other that you would want to add there, Steve? Um, uh, the other is that the AI doesn't get tired at yes. the core. So <laughs> just the fact that it's always there backing you up, always doing what it's supposed to do in a consistent yeah. way. Yep. I love it. That's a good one. That's a good one.
All right. So in my last section, I want to talk about, well, we've been talking about AI and six CX, but I want to give you some use cases. I want to give you some examples of how um, AI is being used to improve the customer experience. Um, let me start with some research that um, IDC did uh, just last year that shows that AI adoption is growing worldwide, right? Um, a, a quarter of an AI initiatives are already in production and a third are already sort of in advanced development stages. Um, and companies have said that they are going to be increasing their AI spending this year. So it's not going away. So we just need to make sure we do it right, we use it right. I think that's really important. The key driver of these companies who are who are you know adopting AI and moving forward with it, I, I think in that study it was more than 50% have said that the key driver is to deliver a better experience for your customers. And the same the same percentage also said to deliver a better experience for their employees because they can make them help make them better at their jobs too, again, through all the things we've already talked about, right? Um, but sadly, about 28% of AI and ML initiatives have failed. And the reasoning behind that, two key reasons. Number one, and I think we all know this, right, that the the talent out there, the, you know, they, there's not the expertise in the job pool right now to do what needs to be done when it comes to um, AI. So that's going to be a huge, I think um, that's going to be a huge trend going forward is we're going to see more um, education, more, you know, in colleges and universities and other places where it's a must, right? Because AI is not going away. And so there will need to be, whether it's degree programs or it's part of courses going forward to and training on the job, right? In terms of upskilling uh, employees to be able to do what needs to be done to, to implement these AI initiatives. And then secondly, and certainly not less important is data and having the right data and the right quality of data, um, production ready data um, for these AI initiatives. So here are a couple different just general high level use cases for customer experience, AI and customer experience, right? We use it to gather and analyze data that can help to facilitate and strengthen our understanding of our customers. And that ultimately then drives a lot of other things happening going forward in terms of the experience, not the least of which is being able to deliver that personalized or hyper personalized experience for your customers. A little typo in this bullet point, predictive and prescriptive analytics are can be used for real time in the moment decisions and, and then offering up next best actions, whether it's for the customer directly or in the contact center for the agent to um, share with the customer at that point or, or help them to be proactive in terms of, hey, this is a customer that looks like they're going to churn based on everything we know about this customer. Here's what we believe you know, out of this analysis, here's what we believe the next best action is for this customer. Automation talked about that already, how that helps to improve the employee experience and drive ultimately the customer experience. And we've talked about some of this contact center agent assistant and efficiencies um, that are introduced through call routing, behavioral analytics, the chat box, the virtual assistants, et cetera. So, so oh, one more slide before I give you some three real life brand examples. So, Customer service is the biggest use case, obviously, especially in retail, travel, and telecom. Other use cases for AI are around pricing, quality control, personalization, just talked about that, fraud detection, and inventory management. And obviously, the usage of each of those varies by industry. So let me give you three, real quickly, three brand, because uh, Steve's got some great information to share with you, so I want to make sure you've got plenty of time to, to talk as well, Steve. So, so let me talk about three brands that are using AI and machine learning to improve their customer experience. So a few years back, McDonald's acquired Dynamic Yield. It's an AI-powered personalization technology. They use that to modernize, personalize, customize, and localize the experience for customers, right? They can show customers menu options based on time of day, the weather, current traffic you know, patterns within the restaurant, and, and just in general, what's trending um, so they can make those recommendations for customers. Disney, this is a pretty popular example, I think, of, of machine learning using the magic band, right? The magic band serves as your ticket, as your fast pass, as your credit card, as your hotel room keys, and so much more, right? They use this to really personalize your experience. They know where you are in the park. They know what you're doing. They know what you've done. They can, you know, it just helps them to really sort of personalize, localize, remove friction and add speed and convenience. And one of the things that's really important is they know where you are waiting in line, right? And waiting in line is painful for you 
and it's painful for them because if you're waiting in line, you're not out there spending money. So, so they use this to help move you a little bit faster through obviously all for you, but definitely for them as well. So, and then finally American express, I, it, they're probably not the only credit card brand that uses AI or, or machine learning to personalize, localize, remove friction, detect fraud, um, make con not only content recommendations, but you know, other types of recommendations for you based on where you are. And, you know, and, and obviously they know where you are because either you've bought a, bought a ticket and you're there or you, they see where you, where you, where your current spending habits are and can make recommendations for what's near you and those kinds of things. So those are some great, um, brand ex examples. And I'm just going to wrap this up before I hand it over to Steve with my five key takeaways here. So AI is great. It is a tool, a technology to help you facilitate and deliver a great experience. It doesn't change your priorities, right? The customer is still at the center of everything you do, including your AI uh, strategy, your, your, um, your digital strategy, right? Um, you just now have different tools to be able to do that. I would say start with the simple stuff, right? You know, it's great. You're like, oh, shoot, you know what? 25% of folks in a third are already deep into their planning levels and implementation of AI. Don't let that stress you out, right? Start with the easy stuff. Don't boil the ocean and take the time to really understand your customer and the customer's needs to make sure that you use AI where it's going to have the biggest impact to start with, right? Um, AI and empathy go hand in hand. So you've got to design and deliver with empathy in mind and keep that in mind as you're, you know, you're with your AI strategy as well. Um, number four, employee experience drives customer experience. AI facilitates both of those. I think I've given plenty of examples of how it helps in, in both regards here. And then finally, data is really at the heart of designing and delivering a great customer experience. Don't ignore it. Make sure you take a look at your data, quality, location, accessibility. It is really critical to the success of any AI implementation. All right, those are my five takeaways. Steve, with that, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Annette. And this is a, a lot of fun. We will uh, uh, reemphasize a few of the things that Annette has said and, and uh, dig down a little further deeper into the, the ML level. First thing I wanna remind people of is the importance of CX as a journey. People are not just a point in time or a place in time. Uh, they are actually um, trying to accomplish particular tasks in their interaction with your brand. So in using AI and ML as, as Annette described to understand, analyze, predict, and meet the person on the journey with relevant actions, offers, responses. That's the, that's the primary goal that we, uh, as, as, uh, marketers and as proponents of new technology should have. Um, second thing I want to note is uh, we need to recognize that the journey, just as Annette is saying, is sometimes confounded by the complexities of data. We have this huge explosion of devices. Many people have two or more phones, multiple different tablets, multiple computers, smart devices, all kinds of different things going on. Same thing is happening in channels and touch points. MarTech is fragmenting like mad with the uh, number of different technology stacks. And we see that leading to much more complex customer journeys. And that's driven by a, a lot of change that's been happening over the past 10 years, but even more so over the past one and a half years. Who would have thought that direct to consumer, um, buy online, pick up in store, uh, all of the, the digital importance would happen. But here we are a year and a half into COVID and we can see uh, that there's been a huge number of changes. And I don't think many of those changes are gonna go back to the way it was before. Uh, and then finally, of course, customers themselves demanding better use of their data, better understanding of them, uh, recognition of their rights and expectations in terms of privacy and compliance require that um, we transform this from sort of a purely transactional set of interactions into a real delivery of consistent and relevant personalized experience. If you are willing to share with me some of your information 
And I promise to you that I will not misuse it. I will not share it. I will um, be a good steward of your information. Then I can deliver you a more um, delightful, interesting, frictionless, faster, easier kind of customer experience. Uh, I'm going to take two minutes and only two slides, and I promise, to talk about what we at Redpoint actually do. Um, we try to meet these needs with RG1, our singular solution to bring together all customer data to then uh, render next best offers, actions, and messages using machine learning. Um, which we'll talk about in some detail a little later. Uh, and then, of course, to give you that delightful CX and orchestrate that experience across your range of touch points. So in order to do that, the very center of this diagram is that automated machine learning. And we want you to understand what we me mean. AI and ML itself needs to be automated, just like we're talking about using AI and ML to help automate the difficult pieces of the customer journey process. So um, as, as Annette talked about, there's not enough talent around to do the AI and ML. There's a wonderful statistic that I love that, that um, says basically 80% of a data scientist's and data engineer's time is used doing data wrangling, doing data prep. That's from the point of view of what they're actually trying to accomplish. That's low value work. They want to be thinking about models. They want to be thinking about experience. They want to be developing and delivering those customer experiences, not doing data wrangling. And if you don't do the data wrangling, then you're stuck with lousy quality data and you don't want that either. So that automated machine learning is to build models using evolutionary steps, automatically figuring out from the data what it is that we're trying to do, deploy those models directly in inside a platform and as a web service so that anybody who needs the intelligence of the machine learning models can get at it. Uh, and then use that same web service and that same capability to automate and optimize the results that you get, feed the data back in, improve the models, and through improving the models, improve the customer experience. Now let's look a little bit about how we use ML to solve the kinds of challenges that customers are facing. We need to recognize that, that the Machine learning is trying, just as we talked about a little earlier, trying to address a comparatively narrow scope of capabilities, things that you can address using essentially mathematical models to describe um, uh, the details of the data and the details of the customer experience. So you want to be able to predict. You want to be able to learn and, and use what you learn uh, about a customer to predict customer behavior, What's the best channel that a customer might want? Um, uh, is a customer about to churn or or about to upsell or you know buy something better? Uh, you want to be able to optimize, recognizing that the world is dynamic and the answers that that we got today or the answers that that our experts, our people experts, may have understood a couple of years ago about how people are operating may no longer apply. And you want to be able to automate because. We don't have enough people, we don't have enough frontline workers, we don't have enough data scientists to do the job and therefore use the machine to scale things up a little bit. So how does that scaling actually work? The interactions that are happening in, in a New York minute, in a, in a interaction with a human, are happening at the speed that the human is trying to operate. The thing that Annette talked about where somebody says, oh, my computer is slow, I'm not getting things fast enough, I'm not seeing enough information. If I come to a website and the website page builds slowly or it puts up irrelevant information or it doesn't seem to be doing what I want, I'm going to surf on over to some other site. I'm going to ignore it. So that means that everything that's happening here, bringing that data together, uh, making a decision about the data, uh, promoting that decision out to uh, a, a website or a mobile app or a store kiosk. All of that happen, has to happen in real time while the customer is waiting. The kinds of business use cases that we're talking about here include those predictions that we talked about where you're trying to figure out 
uh, what is a customer actually likely to do, uh, how is my best message likely to uh, actually be received by a customer, how can I interact with the customer best at their pace and in their time. Uh, other more classical kinds of models or mathematical models where um, per Annette's example of American Express, they're trying to detect an anomaly. That might not be something sinister. Um, it could be fraud, certainly, but it could be, oh, the customer has arrived in um, California and therefore uh, things that I looked at as uh, their buying patterns are now changed. So I have to be able to understand what kind of a deviation am I looking at and what should I be doing about it. Same thing for all kinds of regression models. Where am I going with sales? How many customers are going to come in the stores? Um, the Disney example is a really good one. If I'm seeing traffic that looks like this today, what is the traffic at this ride going to look like at 10 a.m. tomorrow? And can I make sure that people are happy at 10 a.m. tomorrow based on the changes that I'm expecting? And how are customers similar to or different from each other in ways that I can make use of in order to give the customer a better experience. That's clustering. Those are the other kinds of models that, that we want to be able to do. So with those powerful capabilities in hand, um, how do we then actually turn those models into actual results that I care about? Things like um, being able to build out segments and um, use ML rules to, to uh, assist the employee, the marketer, in doing a better job, being able to expose insights and reveal what's going on inside the, the, the uh, uh, customer process itself so that we can improve the customer experience based on that customer process. And that can show up in a lot of different ways. I can build out that cluster. I can then say, I want to use that cluster to decide how am I going to treat the different groups of people. Some people may want to be um, reached by email. Others might want to be reached by a message. Some people might want to be reached first thing in the morning. Others want to do it at the end of their business day. Understanding express preferences as well as behavior patterns of the past allows us to do a better, less intrusive uh, job of reaching the customer without crossing over the line into creepiness. The other thing to recognize is that um, just looking at what's happening to the customer themselves doesn't tell us the whole story. There's a lot of what I would call situational things going on behind the scenes that may tell us information about how we want to operate with customers as well. So things like uh, weather, which is an immediate short-term seasonality, but also things like um, the season itself. When should I be selling snow shovels and parkas versus when should I be selling Hawaiian shirts and flip-flops? Um, inventory, geolocation, and other kinds of information can all also be fed into the model. So we recognize that you're going to be feeding customer data itself into the model, but that's not the only data that's important to allow models to be intelligent and responsive to customers. Uh, last thing I'm going to do is give us a couple of very quick use cases, and then we will have some time for some questions. Uh, first use case I want to use here is just to point out the scale and size of the kinds of things that we're trying to do with machine learning and with AI these days. This is a, a web hosting provider who needed to consolidate a huge number of customer sources, synthesize uh, unique identities for known and unknown customers who were uh, uh, arriving on the front of their site while honoring compliance requirements for their worldwide operation and do all of this in real time, uh, leveraging machine learning to personalize the experience um, in a very, very tight 50 millisecond window. This is what real time really is about and handling it in such a way that they could uh, handle over 20 million decisions a day driven out to the customers to delight customer experience and improve the results that they were looking for. The second example I would give, which sort of goes back to what I was saying about is not just customer data, is a, a consumer products group marketing company that 
uh, sells brewers, K-Cups, other kinds of things uh, with their own direct to consumer channel, and they wanted to be able to deploy product recommendations in front of customers in order to consistently deliver offers across different touch points that would delight the customers. And they did this both by using machine learning and by using plain, ordinary human smarts. Let's see if we can deliver uh, a beautiful, interesting survey that looks for what kinds of things people might be interested in Again, um, a real value proposition. If you tell me a little bit about yourself, what kinds of things you're interested in, what flavor profile you might be interested in, I can deliver you using machine learning product recommendations for the kinds of coffee that, that you might be interested in and delight you with my understanding of how you operate. With those examples, uh, I'm gonna turn this back over to our hosts and Annette and I are very happy to sit down and uh, uh, answer some questions that you may have. Great, thanks Steve. Our first question is for Annette and it's how do we measure the ROI of using AI? Are there easy quick wins to show our senior management? Yeah, I think it, what, what ends up happening when any time that we need to measure ROI is we sort of follow a very similar uh, formula each time, right? We have to identify what the problem is, why we need it, who it's going to impact, how it's going to impact them, and then link that to business outcomes, right? I think that's a pretty generic general formula for um, for. Uh, measuring or, or showing ROI. So I think really with AI, you have to start with a with a simple task, right? AI is is really better at doing some specific task or some some very you know specific yeah just a very specific task. So um, so start with that and improve some internal process and in, improve something, right? Whatever that is, whatever that pain point is. Um, and then make those connections right. Again, it's it's always sort of the same type of formula when it comes to showing AI. Steve, would you do anything differently, or what would you what would you add? No, to that? I think you're exactly right. It's crawl, walk, run. The only thing that I would add is you need to uh, include an experimental mindset. So when you're deploying pieces, make sure that you're measuring what your results are, looking with an open eye, and not making assumptions about how it's going to work. And that way, you can actually. Look look at things, fail fast, um, uh, yeah. do experiments often, and go on from there. Great. Love it. Thanks. Our next question is for you, Steve. What kinds of data do we need to capture to make uh, successful machine learning models? So there's two basically very different classes of models. We talked about them uh, sort of indirectly, but I'll, I'll make it a little more explicit. There are models where you're asking the AI, the ML, to look at your data and tell you something, derive its own insights about it. And those typically are things like clustering models. But there's another whole set of models where you're asking the um, uh, machine learning to tell you, based on this information that I already have about these customers here, what can you tell me about the behavior of this customer coming up here. And for those kinds of models, supervised models, what you need is good, immediate, relevant historical data. If I want to understand whether somebody is likely to upsell from machine A to machine B, I need to have a history. How many people have up made that kind of an upsell before? So making sure that you collect the breadth and depth of data from existing customer interactions to drive your machines um, uh, your machine learning models is very, very important. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why we don't advocate using some generic model based on somebody else's data, but instead say, you should be collecting your own data, developing your own models. Okay. Our next question is from Raphael, and he asks, uh, with the introduction of Cookie List in 2023, how do you see this impacting AI and customer engagement? Uh, if I can jump in, I will. And yeah. then Annette, I'd also love to hear your yeah. thoughts on that. Um, the primary thing I think is going on here is it's, it's 
strengthening the emphasis on collecting your own first party data and understanding your own customers. And it really, in order to do that, I would advocate what I just talked about, which is treat it as a value proposition. You really have to build and develop the relationship with your customer to understand what their preferences are, what their desires are, what they're willing to share with you and what they're expecting to get with it. And that's how you're going to not just navigate, but succeed fantastically in a post cookie world. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. It really does drive higher uh, reliance on really getting to know your customers, right? And, and, and that first party data and, and the feedback and, the, and all of it, right? And having those conversations with customers. Um, I think, you know, you had mentioned about, you know, the sort of situational things, you know, the, I, think, I think that's really important. I think that um, if we if we're specifically talking about, you know, website and, you know, presenting, you know, whether it's ads or presenting content or presenting products, whatever it is, I think it shifts, it shifts it to become more contextual, right? Um, really based on where they are, where, where, what they're looking at, what page they're on, you know, and I guess, you know, this is <laughs> the ultimate cookie list is radio, TV and in-app, right? <laughs> so if we need if we need some examples of how um, we engage with customers with, with no cookies, that's what you look at. In-app, you know, mobile apps don't have cookies, right? And so I think that's a that's a great um, place to look at to figure out how you're going to do it. But I but I agree with you. It really starts with taking the time to understand your customer and start now. Start now because to your point about the historical data and those kinds of things, right? have that start building that now and getting prepared for 2023. Okay, I have one last question and it's for you both, um, Steve and Annette. What do you see as emerging trends in machine learning and AI? Do you want to take a first crack at that, Annette? And then I could just add a little more. Yeah, I'll take a first crack at it. I think I, I mentioned one thing that I think is going to become really important. And this isn't necessarily specific to the AI itself. It's about the people, right? The upskilling, the education, the the lack of that talent pool that we have right now to be able to successfully implement our AI strategy. I think that's going to be something that we're going to see shift here. If it's not already started in the very near future, there's going to be more programs, whether it's technical schools, whether it's uh, universities, colleges, whatever it is, on the job training is going to become that much more important as well. If folks have the patience and the time to do that, you know, and I know AI is about doing things faster and all of that, but, but somebody's going to have to teach these folks too. And then that talent, those employees are going to become, you know, they're going to become golden in, in, in the, you know, employee pool for sure. Um, I think that, um, we've got to address the creepiness factor. And I think that's something that's going to ha happen here sooner rather than later. It has to, if we want, it, you know, that that very small percentage of, of customers who are comfortable with interacting with AI, um, we need to we need to solve for that. And so I think that's something that's going to be addressed here in the near future. I also think one last thing that I'll throw out there because I've worked with some uh, some companies who focus on AI and automation and, and, and those kinds of things as well, is that, that 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 AI ops or that center of excellence is be going to become more and more prevalent within organizations. And I the one thing that I would add is that it needs to be connected. It can't just be sort of its own little, you know, because what I've seen with digital transformation is that there's this digital group and it's sort of this bolt on group over here working on its own doing its own thing this center of excellence has to have you know has to have um interactions and work together with you know your cx group your marketing your ev everybody right because we want to make this sort of a seamless um, experience for your customers and for your employees so i think that's going to be a, a, a big thing that we'll see going forward more of that I agree with all of what you've said, and I would just emphasize that to bring a couple of those threads together, trust and transparency are tightly related, and AI Center of Excellence is the, is the place to really be thinking about that and promoting that so that people will understand how you've made a decision, why you've made a decision, and, and how that decision is going to impact them. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Annette. Uh, that's all the time we have today. So again, thanks to Annette and Steve for this 
engaging presentation. If we didn't get to your question, we will be sure to pass it along to the presenters and they will get back to you. On behalf of MarTech, I wanna thank everyone in our audience for attending this webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thanks, bye now.